Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are watching from. Welcome to Live from the Ranch, where we are actually live from Clicker Expo. And today, I'm your host, Juliana DeWillems, and I have my guest, Ken Ramirez, here. And while my guest, Ken Ramirez, needs absolutely no introduction, let me give him a proper Live from the Ranch intro and welcome. Ken Ramirez is the Executive Vice President and Chief Training Officer of Karen Pryor Clicker Training. Prior to this role, Ken was the Executive Vice President of Animal Care and Animal Training at Chicago's Shed Aquarium. Ken has trained hundreds of different species from butterflies to elephants. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find an animal that Ken hasn't trained. Ken is the only person who runs one of the largest animal training organizations in the country and consults on a variety of high stakes animal training projects, but will still respond to your email within the same business day. Ken, welcome to Live from the Ranch. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be a guest on the, on the show today. <laughs> now, before we dive in, I'm dying to know, how does it, how do you feel before events like this? Do you get nervous anymore? You like about Clicker Expo in Clicker general? Expo, oh, yeah. well, I, I do, because, you know, to me, Clicker Expo is a really important, high-profile time for us to share information. And, you know, there's never a time that you feel 100% on but when you have all of your colleagues there, all judging everything you say, you're always you're always worried. I hope it doesn't come out wrong. I hope it goes well. I have always had a healthy amount of nervousness for any time I would get up and present. So do you get like the like butterflies right before you walk on? Oh yeah, I'm right before going on stage when I'm doing a talk, I, I, I'm really nervous. And it's it's amplified by the fact okay. that I grew up being super, super shy. And so wow. standing up in front of people and speaking is not my comfort place, even though I do it all the time. Now. Okay, so Ken still gets nervous, which means there's no hope for the rest of us. <laughs> and I'm so glad that you mentioned um, when you were younger, because I want to go all the way back to the beginning, oh. uh, the, all the way to the beginning. Oh. Where were you born? I was actually born on Fort Dix Army Base in New Jersey. <laughs> I wouldn't have guessed that. No, my dad was a <laughs> my dad was a medic in Korea, and so he was stationed oh. he was stationed in Fort Dix, and so that's where my mom gave birth to me. Is on the Army base. Wow! And what's your earliest memory of training an animal? You know, it's interesting yeah, I mean, because I grew up on a ranch. My my mom's side of the family. A ranch in New Jersey? No, no, no. no I was. We weren't from the New Jersey area. That's. Got it. I I know nothing about New Jersey until adulthood. When I came back there, I was born there, and then we. Oh. I grew up in in southern New Mexico, and okay. I grew up on a ranch near Alamogordo, New Mexico, and. Uh, I don't have really early recollections of training as much as I have lots of early recollections of riding on horses and herding cattle and doing those kinds of things. Um, I don't think I was fully aware of training other than I remember one of our dogs would give me his paw if we asked for it or it would sit when we asked him to. But other than that, the my uncle and my grandfather actually trained a lot of the cattle dogs to help herd cattle, but I wasn't aware of it. They, when you ask them about training, they would just sort of say, well, they, you just tell the dog to go around and they go around and they didn't even really understand how they got what they got. Uh, so I, I don't think I was fully aware of training until much later. It never, never occurred to me that that was a profession or that that was something that I would be interested in doing and down the road. It didn't happen to me until high school that I started really getting into the idea of training, but I was around animals all the time. So that brings me to my next question, which is, I think I've heard you talk about, you've gotten, you worked in guide dogs as kind of like your entry point to the training world. Well, yeah, for what had happened was I was really interested in, in doing something in my free, in my free time as a high school kid. Oh, and, awesome. and I uh, started volunteering at the Institute for the Blind, which was a guide dog organization in uh, Bloomington, Indiana. They're not there anymore. And um, I got a job as a volunteer. And so my job, early job, was preparing dog food and cleaning kennels. And I used to joke about the fact that I didn't actually ever see a real dog. Uh, I saw them in the distance, but I didn't get to touch them. I didn't work with them. I just prepared the food. But that led me to uh, uh, a groom position. 
And I was excited about that because I got paid 25 cents an hour Ooh, to, uh, wow. to groom the dogs and walk, and walk them in off times and stuff like that. And that was my first uh, uh, job as, a, as a working with animals and being paid for it a full quarter an hour. And that was still in high school. And I was still in high school. And then my last year of high school, they promoted me to what they called a youth handler position. And any dogs that were being trained for young people, they would have us te we test them out and work with them. And that was probably where I got my biggest exposure to training because although I was not making any training decisions, I was, I was holding the harness in my hand and the professional trainer would, would say, pull back on the harness now, tell the dog, good dog, tell the dog this, do this, pet the dog now. So I really paid attention to what I was being told to do. And afterwards I'd say, so I did this because he did it well, right? And I did this because you didn't like what he did. And so I was beginning to understand training, but I was just really the, the hands and feet of, of the trainer as he made the decisions as I was working. I did that for an entire year. So in a sense, I started working with guide dogs while I was still in high school is when I was uh, uh, 16, uh, 15, 16, and 17 years old. And did you ever bring lessons from that back to the ranch, to the ranch dogs? You know, yeah, I think I'm learning. You know, it's interesting. I, you know, as I became more involved in training and my, my family at the ranch knew that that's what I was doing, they were fascinated by the fact that I was training. But I, I, I think most of us who train at least for me, there's a separation between my family and my job. And so, so, tell me so twice. <laughs> when I'm with my family, it's like, they're your dogs. Yeah. And I do not even pretend that I know anything about training unless you ask me, because I just don't want to cross those lines. And so, you know, and I watch, I, I, I visit the ranch, you know, more recent years and my uncle would be talking about something he was doing with his dogs and he'd explain why it worked. And I inside just go, oh, that's such a funny story. I stopped what's going on, but that's, right. I didn't correct him. I didn't say anything. I just simply said, oh, well, that's interesting. Okay. That's fun. And I just, I just never, unless they asked me a question, I never imposed my knowledge or my understanding of training on them because they'd been doing it a long time and they were comfortable with what worked for them. And I enjoyed my time with my family and I didn't feel like I needed to change their, change the way they did things. So you learn that lesson really on and it's, it's kind of an attitude that you've brought into like your career. And now yeah. where you're basically like, until you ask for my help, I'm not going to pretend <laughs> like it's a good, me inserting myself is a good idea here. I have to share this funny story. So this, I, many of you who follow me online, I have a little dog named Mr. Miyagi. Oh, it's we know Mr. Dog. Miyagi. So he had been in a home of, uh, when I was at the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, we had this, uh, physical therapy worker that did a lot of really good work with a lot of our trainers who were in the water all the time. And so he had this dog and he needed to find a home for it. It was just like a one year old dog. And he brought the dog to our house. And so he starts telling me about how to care for the dog. And he starts saying things like, for example, when he goes out and poops, never let him see you pick up his poop. <laughs> And then he said, and the other thing that's really important is that you pick a piece of furniture out that it's okay for him to pee on and allow him to pee there. And I'm listening to all of these crazy things that I, I remember just going, and I just, every single one of them, he just, I go, that's interesting. Yeah. Thank you for that piece of information. And, and finally he left and I looked over at my wife and I said, clearly you've never told him what I do for a living. <laughs> He was giving me all these pieces of information oh, that I'd never heard before. But again, I wasn't about to argue with him. He was no, about to leave this beautiful little dog with me. And no. I just said, okay, don't let him see me pick up his poop. Pick out a piece of furniture for him. Got it. Like, okay. Oh, the origin story of Mr. Miyagi. That's so cute. So you were, you did guide dogs in high school. And yes. I, I have questions about Shed, but that feels like a big jump. So what was it. the moment in your life that you knew animal training was going to be your career? Well, it was sort of, it, it, as I was getting ready to go to college, I had this wonderful guide dog experience, these three years of doing guide dog work. And I remember thinking at the time, what cooler job could there be than playing with and training dogs all day long, but training them for this noble purpose? 
that's what I want to do. I want to train guide dogs. So I started going through college. I took behavior courses and behavior analysis courses, a variety of different courses, thinking that that would be the direction that I would go in. And it was during my high, I mean, during my college life, toward the end, I was almost a senior, uh, where I saw an announcement for a education specialist at a marine life park on Galveston Island. And I thought, oh, outdoors, summer, sounds like fun. <laughs> And it wasn't a training job. It was a teaching classes about animals to young people. I thought, I, I, I think I could do that. And so I went, got the job, did it for a summer. But all of my free time when I wasn't teaching classes, I was hanging out with the dolphin trainers saying, do you do this because of this? And is this a, is this a reinforcer? And are you doing that? Why do you do that? And it got to the point that at the end of the summer, the director of training, all of the trainers seemed to like me, and the director of training came to me and said, hey, we've got an opening for an entry-level position. Would wow. you be interested? And I said, and I said, well, yeah, I, I might be. And he I said, tell me more. He says, well, you have, to, you have to have a degree in biology or marine biology or zoology. And I said, I don't have that. <laughs> and, and, and he said, he said, well, what do you, you have? <laughs> if you switch your major, as long as you're in school, and I said, but this is a five day a week job. So you're going to need to figure out a way to go to school like Tuesdays and Thursdays schedule so that you can take these courses. And, and I said, but if I, 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 I had one semester to go before I was going to graduate from college. And I said oh to gosh. him, I said, if I switch majors, I'm going to have to go to college for like two, three, four more years. And he goes, not a problem. We'll give the job to somebody else. I said, oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh my God. Do you mean to tell me that if I just switch my major, you'll give me this dolphin training job? And he says, yes, but you have to continue. You can have summers off, but you have to continue to stay at school. And that's what got me into to the marine mammal world and the zoo world. That was, oh, sorry. That was sorry. such a hard commit. Like that was, was, you not only committed to the job, you committed to three more years of and what you don't Schooling. understand is while I was a decent student, I wasn't one of those students who was looking to go on to graduate school. Or yeah. was, I couldn't wait. I had like 18 or 16 semester hours and I was done with the oh, university experience and I couldn't wait for it to be done. And suddenly to commit myself to going back, you know, oftentimes when people hear about my college and all the colleges I went to and the universities I went to and I went for nine years and they're going, Master's, PhD? Yeah. What? Oh, what higher no, degrees did no, you get? This, was, <laughs> no, this no. was just so that I could get <laughs> my, the my... I do have a double major, though, so no. that's nice. Oh, that's but. pretty good. So and that ultimately was the right move, because down it the road, was. you ended up at Shedd Aquarium. And what I'm dying to know is how does one become the executive vice president of Shedd Aquarium? Like, talk to me about... How, like, did you work your way up at Shed? Did you know yes. the right people? How no, it was look? an interesting, it was, it, that, that was an interesting story that sort of fell into my lap in a weird way as well. I was the, uh, I was uh, a high ranking officer within the International Marine Animal Trainers Association, which is a organization of marine mammal I'm trainers. Not, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm not. not. Okay. And uh, the curator of marine mammals at the aquarium came to a conference and he wanted to meet with me. And he says, Ken, you really know the people in this industry. Do you think you could provide me with some names of people that might be good as a training director, a director of training? And I said, I said, sure, I'll do that. And I came back and I said, well, here are three names that I think would be really good. And I said, but I have a fourth name that I'd like to submit as well, if that's okay. And I didn't know if it was appropriate and I said, so if, if this is inappropriate, here are the three people I would recommend. But if it was inappropriate for me to suggest myself, I wasn't sure if there was a conflict of interest because he was coming to me as an IMATA officer mm -hmm. to, to share with him. So, so I made that suggestion. And uh, he, they ended up bringing me on and brought me to Chicago to meet the, the CEO and all the different big players that were, and they were building this brand new Marine Mammal Pavilion. And so I came on board as the director of training, director of husbandry and training. And from there, um, over a period of time, I 
directed the entire marine animal, marine mammal department. And then as the organization really saw the benefits of training, they said, gosh, you know, maybe we should train our sharks. And, oh, maybe we should train these the birds that are in this Amazon exhibit. And maybe we should. And before long, I was in charge of training everything at the aquarium. And then at that point, they realized how to, what, a, what a big role that was. And so then I moved into a position overseeing those departments, which then led me to getting a position that oversaw the veterinary staff and the veterinary team and the conservation team. Wow. And so my team just grew as I took on more responsibility with bigger and bigger areas of the, of the so as, as I got to know the aquarium and I was always still connected to the Marine Mammal Division where I trained. Uh, and one of the things that's interesting is one of the unique things about my job there is as I kept climbing the ladder, you know, I'm getting further and further away from the day to day job of working with the animals. But my team was always surprised that I always assigned myself training goals and I still managed to get out there and train on a regular basis because that was the thing that I loved. And I said, I'll take this higher level position, but if I have to completely leave Never the day to day, my animals. No, exactly. Yeah. Wow. And so how long were you at Shed for? 27 years. Wow. So then obviously we all know that you ended up moving to the Pacific Northwest to run Carapire Clicker Training's ranch. And how was that move from the city of Chicago to rural Seattle? Well, was you know, it was it was a it was a it was a move that I wanted to make because I had taken on when Karen turned 80. It was around her 80th birthday that she came to me and said, gosh, you know, I'm thinking maybe I should think about retiring. Ken, do you think you'd like to step into this position? And I was very honored, was flattered, but I didn't jump right at it because I was I had always assumed I would retire at the aquarium. You know, that's where I would be till the end. So I, I took a little bit of time to think about it. And then they invited me to Boston where the offices were. And I sat in on a lot of meetings and and watched sort of the way the team operated and finally decided to, to take on a position uh, with, with them and take over Karen's role. And, uh, and at that point, I was still living in Chicago. I was still there. Uh, I was working as a consultant at the aquarium still. Uh, but I did that. And then it was while I was, it was when I removed myself from the aquarium and I no longer had any animals to take care of. I said, I have an idea. Why don't we build this ranch where I can teach and do training? And that was sort of how it got folk. It became a part of the aquarium. I created the idea myself and then started saying, where do I want to live? And so we looked at Colorado. I looked at, uh, um, at, so the Pacific Northwest, I looked at Texas and I looked at uh, in North Carolina for the three or four places that I looked at actual properties. I went and looked at properties and I knew what I had in mind for what I wanted the classes to be and the kind of animals I thought would be perfect. And that changed over the years, but ended up coming to the Pacific Northwest. And that's where the rest is history. Well, well, I think we all are grateful that you went to Seattle and not to the heat of Texas because that <laughs> Mount Rainier backdrop it, is, it is and those beautiful. temperatures most of the year, right. incredible. So speaking of the training branch that you created, I want to talk to you a little bit specifically about your training. What's one word you would use to describe the way that you train? I know like one yeah. word is very hard for you, one <laughs> but I think it, word. I would be so interested to hear. Can it be a hyphenated word? Fine, fine, <laughs> that's fine. Let's see, one word, what I say? Um, you know, I don't, I, I, I generally would say I'm a positive reinforcement trainer, but it's not, it's the essence of what I am, but I don't think about it as being the, that, that's, that doesn't completely encapsulate it to me. Uh, I, if I had to use one word, I would say I try to be a compassionate trainer. Yeah. Not, it's not a type of training. It's just what I think of as what I, and to me that encompasses good welfare, it encompasses positive reinforcement, it encompasses all of the things that I think are important to what I try to teach and what I try to live when I train. And I like, that makes total sense. And I think that's why when you when you ask somebody to really think of one word that just describes the way that they train, I think it, it, one, it gets you thinking, but it really can talk a lot about kind of 
the underneath values. Yeah, it does. And it was interesting because I thought, you know, I, you didn't send me a list of questions you were going to ask. I had no idea what was coming. And I, 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 I didn't think I was going to be able to come up with the word until I thought about it a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah. We, great, good job. You thought of one word. You. Excellent. And so speaking of your compassionate training style, I, I believe you've spoken about that initially you okay. used punishment inclusive training with the guide dogs. Do you sure. consider yourself to, to come back to more labels? Do you consider yourself a crossover trainer? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, I, I never used that term until I saw people in the, in the public using it or calling themselves a crossover trainer. And I feel like because I absolutely started in an organization where we were taught to use corrections to correct unwanted behavior, taught to use reinforcement to, for good behavior, I was very definitely uh, a trainer who had to cross over because of the fact that I had learned to use punishers effectively in my training. And thank goodness I went to work in a zoological organization that already had a positive reinforcement based thinking because it was forced on me. And I kept thinking, yeah, but if you put a little correction in here, you can make that behavior go away faster. But I realized that wasn't necessarily the case. So I really learned that. But again, talk about feeling how foolish you are. In my younger years as a young trainer, when I became a trainer, for the first couple of years, I thought, oh, with exotic animals, you use only positive reinforcement. And with dogs, you use punishment and positive reinforcement. And to me, that was just crystal clear until it was a day that I was working with a tortoise, an Aldalva tortoise, that I realized, wait a minute, I can do this with my dogs. They don't have, it was a weird aha moment for me. And uh, it, uh, and then, then I felt terrible for the longest time that all my, my dogs at home that I had treated them. I mean, I felt like I was being kind, but I was using those punishers when necessary. And it killed me. It killed yeah. me for years to have to admit that I was, that I didn't realize, but I recognize now that's why I have a lot of compassion for people that are trying to make the transition because it isn't always easy. And, and so, I, I, I don't want to ostracize somebody just because they've chosen to use those tools. I say, I get it. I know where you're coming from and I've been there. Let me help you transition away and not think of you as a bad person because you did that. Because I didn't think of myself as a bad person. I just didn't have the knowledge or the understanding of how to do it. Yeah, I remember it was actually a few years ago. I used to, growing up, I rode horses and I, same thing, like look back and realize, oh my gosh, I can't believe the way basically that I treated my horse. And I wrote a post on Instagram basically saying like, I feel so much guilt for the way that I treated my beloved horse. And you wrote this really nice comment basically saying like, until we know better, we, you know, we do the best we can with the information we have. And like, please like, do better now and like there's not it doesn't right. serve you to just right. carry those feelings of like guilt and but i understood them i, I remember yeah. that post i remember thinking to myself oh this oh she doesn't have to beat herself up mm -hmm. i we all have been there and you know you, you use the tools that you know how to use and until you know how to use them better you you can't change totally totally can you think of a training scenario that felt really challenging where you didn't know if you could solve the problem or you had trouble solving the problem? <laughs> yeah, I, I have a lot of <laughs> scenarios like that. I mean, many of the scenarios that I get presented with at the early stages, I always am befuddled and going, oh my goodness, I don't know if I qualified to do this. I don't know if I know how to solve this problem. Um, so yeah, there, there are a lot of them that come up. And for me, those the more challenging ones in recent years have been some of my conservation projects where you're dealing with animals in, a, in an uncontrolled environment where you're trying to make changes so that they can shift their behavior. Um, and you have government agencies and huge organizations who are hanging on your every word to say, how are we gonna do this? And how are we gonna make this happen? And you want to be successful at it. Uh, so those kinds of things come up all, all the time. And then when I think about situations that I've had in my animals that I've worked with on a regular basis, we do have challenging behaviors that come up. I talked about, I've talked about many of them in, in training scenarios in, in Clicker Expo or other places. I had a, a young beluga whale that had, had been born into our care, who was for the first five years of her life was our little princess because she 
It was perfect. She did all behaviors well. Any new trainer, we could put them to work with her and she'd do perfectly. But then her behavior started to fall apart and we didn't know why. And, and it took me a long time to figure out how to solve that problem because we'd allowed the problem to get to build up year over year over year before we even tried to address it. And so even though I understood what was going on, finding a solution took a lot of time and effort. And it, it took me convincing my entire staff to try an unorthodox approach to fixing it. And they all thought I was crazy at first. I, I remember thinking to myself, <laughs> I made this suggestion that we were going to give the little whale the opportunity to say no. Mm -hmm. And if it said no, we would reinforce her for saying no and we'd move on. And they would think, oh. and I remember thinking, I know it was a crazy idea, right? <laughs> I, I remember thinking to myself, I after the meeting where I asked them to try it, I swear they were all looking at us and said, you know, Ken usually has good ideas, but I think the old man has lost yeah, it. I think he's, he's lost off the rails. <laughs> he's off the rails. Because <laughs> they, did, they didn't understand what, what I was trying to get at. But but that, that was just an example of one of those, because it perplexed us for years before we found the solution. Years, wow. Yeah. Well, part of it was, what happens in a large organization is, you're the trainer who's working with the animal, you make a mistake, you don't talk about it right away. You might write it in the records. It doesn't get to the supervisor's attention for for until it's a problem. And then the supervisor says, oh, I'm skilled enough to handle this myself, so they don't take it to their boss. So by the time it got to my desk, the problem had existed for like two or three years. And then looking at records and researching it and looking at the data to figure out why it had happened and what we needed to do to fix it, it was a long time. It was a, It was one of those things that just didn't, the solution didn't just pop in my head easily. I, it was a, it was a conglomeration of different th events that had caused it to happen, and it was almost like we had painted ourselves into a corner, and nobody could figure out how to get out of it now. You know, and, uh, and that's why it took so long. And it ended up teaching you a lesson that has now like become a message for so many. It is. It's weird trainers. how commonly this this, this <laughs> subject comes up about giving animals choice and giving them agency. And, and I remember when we, when that became a big conversation piece, it didn't even occur to me that that's what I was doing in this particular case, but that was exactly what, what we had done. Have you ever found yourself in danger during a training session with all of the crazy species that you have yes. worked with? I've been in danger a couple of times and I'm very fortunate that Nothing more, no, nothing worse has happened to me that I have all my body parts and I'm still walking you around. Better knock on wood. Uh, I know it's those alpacas, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, uh, the 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 two times it's, it were the most. I was working in free contact with tigers, and we had a, a system set up where someone was always outside the enclosure using a recall to call the tigers away if if, if there was if there was danger and the uh i remember i tend to be reasonably coordinated but i was running around with tigers they we would have the tigers chase us and they would take us down like we were praying does that like and, and totally you know, in retrospect when i show people videos That's of this crazy. in one of my classes i show people videos of this and i say i cannot imagine what the wisdom was of running like prey from your tiger but that's what we did but the tigers became very used to the way we would play with them and we wrestled with them and stuff like that and one of the times that i was running around my foot fell into a hole and i twisted my ankle and fell to the ground in a way that wasn't the normal, normal way <laughs> and always we had always been taught that that if something unusual like that happens that tigers can take advantage of it and so I fell, the tiger did not jump on me, but paused, looked at me, and, and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm this about to eat dinner. Yeah. And then I, the trainer who was off, 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 uh, off exhibit sounded the recall and the tigers all ran back to the recall and I pulled myself out of the exhibit. And that was one of those times when I have no idea what would have happened. But it scared me. Thank goodness and, you didn't have to find out. No, and, that's and then, for sure. And then the biggest, one of my bigger injuries happened once. I was in charge of a program in Texas, and we had a policy, a, a, a dive safety policy. And our policy was you never, ever, ever go into the water, ever, without a tender. It was just a safety policy. 
And it was the end of the day, it was six o'clock and everybody's ready to go home. And I dropped my whistle to the bottom of the pool. And I thought, I jumped in. I thought, I'm going to get it really quick. It's not a big deal. I jumped in. I went all the way down. Frito got my whistle. And one of the dolphins came up. It's one of the most playful dolphins around. Grabbed me by the leg and took me down to the bottom uh, of the pool. And I'm thinking, I don't have enough air. And I thought, OK. I, I, he, he, he let go for a minute. And I swam up, grabbed a breath of air, yelled for help, and he pulled me back down again. And the next thing I knew, I. I ripped my leg out of his mouth because I needed to get up for air. And then the next thing I know, he disappeared and someone heard me yell for help and called the dolphins away. And I swear this was a wonderful, I think he was just playing, you know, playing with me. And, um, uh, but I, I, I was gonna, I thought I was gonna drown right then and there. Like, That's like really giving like near death experience. <laughs> <right>. That's crazy. <laughs> That's so crazy that that's just like in your vault of life experiences. It's nuts. And that is, it's very juicy. So thank you for sharing because that was why I asked the question. And does it, um, I mean, you, you probably with that perspective now understand why things like protected contact are important, et cetera, et cetera. I do a lot of consulting with, with big cat programs. And I always say, don't do free contact with big cats. Yeah. Like, even though I loved doing it when I did it, I would never, never do it today. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, on a lighter note, um, <laughs> what's one animal you haven't trained yet, but you want to train? If you, you, know, if you know, that's a, that's a really good question. And the, the thing about that that's hard is I think that if I wanted to, or if I was interested, I would find <laughs> okay. a way to, to do it because <laughs> you know, several years ago, before you mentioned the butterflies, if someone had asked, what's a species you've never trained before, I would have never said butterflies. It would have never occurred to me to say butterflies, but yet that was, when it came up, it was a really great experience. And then that led me to a spider training experience. And again, I don't think I would have ever, it's not on my bucket list to train a spider, but when I got to do it, I thought it was a lot of fun. And uh, so there are lots of animals that I've never trained before. And usually they're animals that I just haven't had access to. Um, but I always find it fascinating to train a variety of species. There's so many hundreds of species of birds that, that would be wonderful to train uh, that I've never trained. Uh, there's quite a few Australian animals that I've never trained that I think would be fun to train. Uh, so I, but but when I think of the big ones, I've trained kangaroo before, and I've trained the koala before. But you know, it's just it's there's 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 always going to be something new that you haven't done before. What was really interesting for the longest time. I was just a few years ago at Expo, I said, you want to know an animal I've never trained before? Never trained a horse. But I have since then. But uh, how did, it how, just, how did that I, happen? I grew up around <laughs> horses, but they weren't my horses. I, uh, I just never really had an opportunity to train one. I've consulted with people that trained horses, but I don't ever say I've trained it if I haven't actually been there with the food, handing it to the animal Making and actually decisions. training. I mean, uh, but uh, I had just never been in a situation where I had trained a horse before. And uh, and then soon after, as soon as I said that, Alexander Curlin got me invited. <laughs> like, we have to fix this. She invited me to, she was doing some consulting with uh, the, the big Cavalia horse show yeah. and, and they were doing stuff in, in Montreal. And, to come up here and we'll play for a week. And I got to do a lot of training up there with their horses. And so it was really cool. Wow. And, you know, again, when you kind of mentioned these crazy experiences offhand that you've gotten to do, yeah. you really, your training takes you all over the world. Yes. What's some of the coolest, what's one of the coolest projects Besides, right. besides obvious, the yeah. elephants, yeah. butterflies, like, I get, that's fine. You can do the low hanging fruit. Well, the elephant, the, because the elephant project is such a big one for me right now, and it's still ongoing, it's really important to me. But I will say, what my consulting has done for me is given me exposure to things. And I remember my first time being asked to consult with the zoo in South Africa. And this was pre-apartheid. This was like, this was a long time ago. And I'm up there teaching about how to how you should care for animals and how you should in all the right ways of making sure you give them the best care possible and i remember after the second day i would gotten to know the keepers and most at that particular time almost all of the frontline keepers were all black south africans 
most of the supervisors were white South Africans. And I got in really good with the keepers and they invited me to this evening thing with, with their families and stuff as barbecue. And they were sitting down and, they, and I remember they sat down and said to me, Ken, we understand what you're telling us, but you're asking us to treat the animals better than we are treated ourselves. And I remember that experience, it really hit me. I, I realized, you know, different cultures, different experiences, you know, how do you expect someone to give care to an animal when they themselves are not being treated with the respect or given the, the courtesy or the, the and, 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 it, and I remember going back to my hotel room that night and I cried, I cried. I said, I don't have an answer for them. I don't know how to tell them how to solve this. And, and I thought about it. I didn't sleep at all that night. And I said, I'm going to come up with a solution. And, 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 and at the time I, I, I felt like we, we came up with a solution that the, that the keepers really liked, but it was still a solution that even that today would have, would probably be considered inappropriate, but it was not inappropriate for them at the time. And it helped them change their situation and, and gain and, and get better get better treatment from their supervisors. But it was such a hard one because as a consultant, you don't have the ability to come in and change things. You're you're there to make suggestions, you're making recommendations, but it was, I know that wasn't an animal story, but it was one that affected me so deeply because it made me just, it took me out of my situation about talking about all these wonderful things you should be doing for the animals that you care for and find out that that life experience for them was not the same and they were it was difficult for them to see it from my perspective and it was it was a it was a life-changing experience for me and i several of those keepers are still around working now they've come up in the in the zoo world and they 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 have positions of authority now and have brought me back to south africa several times but it was it was a I can't even describe it to you without, I, I, I would get very emotional thinking about it because it was such a difficult question to be asked. And I was baffled. I didn't have an answer at the tip of my tongue at that moment. I said, I have to think about this. Yeah. Have there been other times in your consulting career where you've been presented with a really challenging situation with maybe like around, obviously not with directly with the training because that you have yeah. influence over, but yeah. where around that, you were put in a tough spot. It was a similar situation where I, I run into it a lot of situations where you you sit down with a group of trainers and you find out that the management structure within their organization is not suitable or doesn't allow them the freedom or the ability or the growth or the they're stifled because of, of policies and things like that. And I do feel like I have some ability to change that sometimes, but it's often... I face often with people who are in low level positions where they don't have a lot of authority and, and they would love to see their organization do all the things that I teach, but they can't make those decisions. And so I work with them a lot on how they can affect their behavior. I, I'm a fan of saying that training is not hierarchical. You don't have to be the boss. You don't have to be the in charge. When you are the boss, it gives you more freedom. But the reality is you can affect in a lots of different directions. And you just have to think a lot about uh, the things that are motivating your supervisors. You know, everybody, there's something that motivates your supervisor. They're either motivated by saving money in the budget or they're motivated by your production of, of, of papers, you're writing papers that are motivated by something. And more often what I would do in situations like that is find out what their boss was motivated by because that will often motivate them and finding ways of giving them what they're looking for so that you get more freedom and more their trust you more because you're helping them achieve their goals. And that's kind of the way I, I tend to approach that. Empowering your learners. Shocking. <laughs> uh, this was a question from a viewer. Has the butterfly training video been shared anywhere yet? The million dollar question. So here's the thing. It, ha it, 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 it has been shared in very private circles in my home. Uh, oh, so you've I, seen it? I have the video now. 
I'm not. <laughs> All right, the, Kevin, I, what do we need to do? <laughs> the problem is that like, well, if uh, I show it in a public way, <laughs> yeah. I believe there's a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar fine. Okay, so the go fund me. We'll, we'll be so posting today. The, the 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 minute it shows on the BBC, okay. I have the rights to show it, and okay. I will bring it to Expo. I will bring it everywhere. But it's interesting. It got hung up due to a legal battle, and then it got hung up because of COVID, which mm -hmm. the convoluted way COVID affected it is kind of crazy. But I still believe it will be released sometime soon. And what's nice is I don't have to wait to get it from somewhere. I have, have it, it in that computer. Uh -oh, uh -oh. <laughs> I shouldn't say that because someone might steal it. I was going to say. We'll <laughs> but but, but I'm not allowed to computer. show it. But I have shown snippets of it now in some of my classes that, that I can show. I have shown little one-minute segments of, wow. of, of it. So. Would you say that it like lived up to your, the, it, the it, footage it, lived up to your expectation? It, it, it's it's amazing the, the high definition footage of the butterflies flying, wow. and BBC does it in slow motion to the Philharmonic music playing. It just it's beautiful to see. Oh it's my really, gosh! Okay, really well, we'll be counting down, crossing our fingers that it gets it's I'm, free for us to I'm, see soon. I'm waiting for it myself. What? Or just sign up for a class. Oh yeah, okay. Or just sign up for a class with the ranch because you might get a sneak peek. Just like you can see. It. You know, there's and animals. Who cares about those? Speaking of that, stuff. not only that, might you see butterfly video? But right now we have this cute little baby alpaca. We won't have a cute He's baby alpaca to next to year. Yeah. Yep. This year is the only year you'll be able to come and maybe feed a baby <laughs> alpaca. That you might be able to touch one. And she's really, really. She's only 17 pounds. What's right her now. name? Elote is her Elote. name. Elote. And if you follow me on Instagram, you can see her. Yeah. She's a beautiful little. But next year she won't be a baby anymore. She'll be a boring old teenager. And we don't have we don't have any males to give for to produce new female uh, new uh, new offspring. So. This is the year to come. She's the cutest marketing <laughs> tactic you guys have ever had. Actually, I actually ever talked about with our marketing team the idea of trying to sell the fact that she's a little baby right now. It yeah, just dawned on me. Totally. You won't get a chance to see her next year. She's got to come this year. Brilliant. Okay, I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you your thoughts on the industry right now. Okay. Or the thoughts of the industry. Just, sure. The industry. That's our next topic. Okay. What are your thoughts on the state of the industry right now? You know, I, I am surprisingly probably more optimistic about the state of the industry than most people seem to be. I think there's... It's probably uh, because you're not on social media. That's probably true. <laughs> it's, I, I stay away from social media. I, I just rely on Sarah and uh, Rachel to tell me what's going on on social media. But uh, I, I feel good about the fact... I, I kind of tend to look at the era of training in the dog training world in 10 and 15 year increments. And when I look back at what I saw happening in the dog training world 50 years ago when I was working at the guide dog school and the number of places you could hear about positive reinforcement training were almost nil. And I don't know the percentage of positive reinforcement trainers today, but I would say, based on the things that I see, I would say we are easily past the 50% of professional dog trainers or more are moving toward positive reinforcement. So when I look at 50 years ago, it was like less than 10%, and today it's more than 50%. And I look at it from that far away perspective, I go, we are making great strides. When I look at the professional dog working world, police dogs, search and rescue dogs, guide dogs, those industries are moving away from the use of aversives. They are looking for ways to use positive reinforcement. They, I, I don't have enough time in my day to do the consulting that I'm being asked to do because they want to see a way to move there. And we are moving the needle gradually and slowly in the right direction. So I'm very optimistic. I do, I do agree with you. Although I'm not on social media a lot, I do peek at it. I do see it when it's called to my attention. I pay attention oh, to it. Back just a you little. know, and and there's no question that you know this year alone we began the year dealing with what dog daddy and all of that <laughs> controversy, and then more recently there's been all this controversy about Lima and uh, and 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 I think those are blips, and you know, and I think sometimes we have these knee jerk reaction to something, and then. 
it passes by and they go, okay, maybe that wasn't as big of a deal or maybe it was a big deal and good thing we took care of it. I, I do like the fact that what social media does for us is it does allow us to communicate with each other better. Unfortunately, it also allows us to communicate with each other worse, but it, I do think, I do think we are in a, in a hopeful place. There's a lot of people really calling attention to what we do. There's a lot of discussion about licensure. There's a lot of discussion about certification. There's a lot of discussion about moving the industry in that direction. And, and I, I'm all in favor of, of finding ways to get us all on the same page, to find standards that we can all agree on. Um, I just am very hopeful and very optimistic that we'll get there. And so I, uh, will there be controversy? There always will be controversy, you know, and there, there will, there will never be a world that I believe will exist where every animal trainer uses exclusively positive reinforcement. That just isn't very realistic and isn't going to happen. Um, but I love to think that positive reinforcement and that kind of kind, thoughtful, compassionate training becomes the norm. And if that becomes the norm, then I will be happy about that. And then, so there may be an occasional aversive tool that creeps into things, but I think what people have seen is in industries where we have, where I have worked, where we really work to push toward positive reinforcement, we see that as those trainers become better and more skilled at using positive reinforcement, they find themselves not needing to go to the punishment tool or the aversive tool. And all of a sudden I've seen, I remember this first time I was working with this one police officer at this one organization I worked with and I came in and he says, Ken, I just realized I haven't done a collar correction in three years. Wow. And he said that to me and he, you know, he was keeping track of it, you know, yeah. you know, because he very gradually was making his way toward that. And he, and, and that's what I was looking for was that he, he didn't feel he needed he to, he yeah. didn't need it. And, and that's the kind of change that I like seeing that makes me feel good about where the community and our industry is going. I think that message of like zooming out and not <laughs> totally focusing on like the drama of the day or the week or the month or the year is so important because we can get so lost in it, but you're absolutely right. We have to look at the overall trajectory that things have gotten so much better. It really has. And it really has. And I think for me, I have the advantage of having worked in lots of different industries so that I've worked in the zoo community and I've worked in the law enforcement community. I've worked in the guide dog community. I've worked in, you know, so I have exposure to a lot of these organizations or, or groups of trainers that don't overlap very much. You know, you don't, you don't see a lot of those organizations overlapping. I think guide dog organizations come to Clicker Expo a lot, so we see them. There's usually a handful of search and rescue trainers that come to Clicker Expo, but we don't see the, the big search and rescue community coming out to talk to, to, to a Clicker Expo. And we certainly don't see a lot of law enforcement. And when they do have law enforcement, there's three or four of them in the crowd and they kind of keep the secret, you know, or they come and talk to me privately. And, and I want them to feel welcome to come because I think there are so many great things you can get from a uh, from a Clicker Expo or from any positive reinforcement conference. Totally. And speaking of welcoming, what are your thoughts on diversity, equity, inclusion, and now they've added a B, belonging within the industry? How can we continue to make the industry more diverse and also welcoming to BIPOC trainers? I think that's a really important question. It's certainly something that at Clicker Expo, we have devoted time and panel discussions to asking those questions from people who are in those communities, who are who are at times feeling not not like they don't belong. And I think that the awareness of the importance of diversity and inclusion was an important trend that became popular in the last several years. But I think the adding of that belonging is an important aspect to it because it's such a big part of, of really feeling included, you know, feeling like you're a part of something. And so I think there's a lot of different things that I think we can do. Now for an organization like Clicker Expo, we, we, we really work hard to look for diversity in speakers. Uh, we are teaching a lot of classes and we're constantly searching for diverse 
speakers who who bring something new to the table and who can can uh, can make that a norm so that it, I, I would love to see the day where we look at a group of trainers at Clicker Expo and your people aren't going there were five people of color in that whole in that whole that whole place and instead it's just no it almost becomes you look around and you go well of course there's hundreds of people of color in here this it's, it's it's just a normal thing and i think because of our country's history because of humanity's history because of all of those things we will always be calling attention to it because we have to continue to work on it the day we quit calling attention to it might be will only happen if we get to the point that there is true total equity but what i think ends up happening is you put a lot of attention on one particular marginalized group and things get a little bit better with that group and then this group over here saying what about us and everybody goes oh well, we got to work on that and then this group is saying you forgot about us and so I think that it's us being aware of that, being conscious of it, and making an honest effort to continue to strive to meet those needs. And a big part of it is, and that's why we've done these panel discussions, is asking people, do you feel welcome here? And if not, why not? What can we do to make you feel more welcome here? And I think that's something that we have to do in each of our own organizations and in our smaller training groups. It's it's an important thing. And I think there are some organizations out there who do it exceptionally well, you know, that that they just said, nope, you know, we're only having BIPOC speakers in this particular series. And I think good for them. Good for them to be able to, 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 to do that. And I think we just... For me, it's just one of those things that has to be a high priority. And it's always been important to me. And uh, and I think it's important to us as an organization and it's important to us as an industry. So. I love that. And I agree. I look forward to the day where we come to conferences like this and there's so much more diversity. So now I'm going to switch to some fun questions okay. that are a little less training related. Okay. Um, What's Ken's version of an ideal Saturday night? Uh, when I am, the best way for me to answer that question is when I am trying to disconnect. You uh, disconnect? What? You know? No way. You know, it's, there, there, there was a time when I was at the Shedd Aquarium and I was responsible for that entire collection. I could not go to a movie without having my cell phone on and sitting on an aisle seat because if an animal needed help, I needed to jump up and go do it. I don't feel that kind of responsibility now. And so when I go to a movie, I can sit in the middle of the theater and turn my phone off and off and everybody knows I'm not available for the next couple hours. And so for me, losing myself in a story, going to the theater, going to a film is my idea of disconnecting because I can get lost. The, my, the CEO of the Shed Aquarium, his wife said to me once, I know why you love movies so much, Ken. It's because you can get lost for a couple of hours in another world. And I think, yeah, it's probably true. I, I'm a very avid uh, film buff. And I, I'm a theater person. I go to the theater all the time. And being able to lose myself in that other world is a great experience for me. It's, it's just a, it's, 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 it's a- It's your decompression time. It's a decompression place. Yeah. It's a happy place for me. Wow, I never would have thought. What's your what's a movie that you like that you've seen recently? Oh, not, like the theaters you know, are really it's, like it's not, really odd that there, so there haven't been as many big movies. I, I, I saw Dune to the new Dune, and I was impressed with the the, the landscape and the spectacle yeah. of that all. I thought it was really good, but I'm I'm not I'm not a, a, the kind of film buff who likes one kind of movie. I'll go to silly romantic comedies i'll go to horror films i'll go to adventure films i i, I like them all so I'm... well we know you just saw one of my favorite uh three hour movies <laughs> the Aristor concert oh i did <laughs> uh, you're, you're absolutely right i can't yeah. remember, you remember that i actually went to see the taylor, taylor swift, swift concert and, and i because i'm not this super i didn't think i knew her work at all you thought it was going to be a documentary and, no, i did first i didn't think it was a documentary i was surprised Surprise, to find out music. it was a three-hour concert but i was also surprised like oh i've heard that song oh, i know that song oh, know she's that everywhere song and what was really interesting i was in la when i saw it and so 
I went with a fairly full house of wow. Swifty, yeah. where people were dressed up and they were standing up and singing. Oh. And, and I'm sitting like, oh, this is an experience. Uh -huh. But yes, I did. I, I go see all kinds of films. The cinematic experience came. came I don't know that I would go to see her in concert, but I enjoyed oh. seeing the Eris Turon film. <laughs> if you weren't an animal trainer, what would you be? If your career didn't take you to animals? Uh, I would probably still be an educator of some kind. Uh, I mean, I, it's a hard question for me to answer because I, I do have other careers that I do now. How, so, like, so how do you have time? So, what? Con so consequently, <laughs> I, I'm not picking those because those are things I'm already doing. So oh my I, I, I don't know. I don't know what else. How I'm many hours of sleep do you get a night? I get a lot. <laughs> Like no, last night, so I think I got four wait. hours of sleep and I feel great. Oh my gosh. You know that the saying, like, you have the same 24 hours as Beyonce? Like, <laughs> we all have the same 24 hours as Ken and yet somehow I don't get the same amount of stuff done. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now I have some rapid fire this or that question. Okay. So you just get to pick which one. Okay. Okay. Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Easy. Beach or mountains? Mountains. <laughs> okay. Morning person or night owl or night owl. both. <laughs> my, 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 my good time. Clicker ring or regular clicker? I'm surprised I have gravitated the clicker ring now. Oh. I really like it because it keeps my hands free. But I, I like oh. the regular clicker, but I pick the clicker ring. Okay. Um, this you kind of already answered this. Concert or movie theater? Movie theater. Yeah. <laughs> Although about, the right for the right concert, I will go. You know, okay, I, I had on my other question that I wasn't gonna I didn't think we had time for, but what kind of music do you listen to? I listen to a lot of stuff, but the uh, my 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 tend to my happy place tends to be like fifties and sixties rock. <laughs> I mean, it's just okay. Fair answer. A uh, pizza or cookies? Oh. Savory or sweet? <laughs> cookies. I'm gonna okay. go with cookies. Real meat treats or freeze dried treats? Real meat treats. <laughs> Airplane or train? Love a train, but I. But I always choose there if I, yeah. I want to get there faster. Yes, fair. Presenting in person or presenting via Zoom? Oh, person. In person. <laughs> I'm so happy to be at Clicker Expo where, where I get to see We're live back people. In person, yeah. Even even for even today for live from the ranch, we actually have audience out yeah. here. I can look out and see people smiling. Oh, they're here. Yeah. They're real people. <laughs> they like their jokes. Good. Um, book or podcast? Book. Okay. And I train. haven't gotten into the habit of listening to podcasts. I listen to them when I know it's something I really want to hear, but I'd rather read it myself. By the way, we still need to turn Life from the Ranch into a podcast. There you go. That's like a, that's like, people talk, actually talk to Aaron about that. A lot of people actually call show. it a podcast. People say, your podcast. You listen I to say, it. Which podcast? Yeah. Oh, oh, Life from the Ranch. I'm yeah, telling that's you, right. that's, that's where we're going. You're only be like five years behind, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> and then training animals or training people. Well, I train animals what I choose first. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that is all I have. So thank you, Ken, so much. That was so much fun. You're an excellent guest. Well, thank you. It's that been fun. It's nice been fun time. turning the microphone over to you. I didn't have to think about this one at all. It's just no. like Julia oh, yeah, has got this. You did a great gonna... job thinking on your feet. <laughs> and now you have fulfilled your guest duties. So I'm going to pass back to you. All right. This sounds <laughs> I'm good. putting my guest to work. All right. Well, we want to we want to invite you to join us next month for a live from the ranch it's the first thursday of every month we'll be back at our normal time which is 1 p.m pacific time 4 p.m eastern time um we are have a couple of possible guests so until we narrow that down we'll make that a surprise but join us on may the 2nd for our next live from the ranch and don't forget we have all sorts of wonderful offerings and things that we're doing uh ahead care and private clicker training we're going to put a list of special offers on the screen I'm not going to read them off to you. We just want you to have a good time, happy training. Hopefully, you'll be here in the area, in the Portland area, and come to Clicker Expo this see weekend. See you tomorrow. And we'll maybe yeah, see you tomorrow. But if not, we will see you next month on Live from the Ranch. Okay. Bye, bye bye. Thanks, Juliana. <laughs> bye. Thanks, guys.